Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day, subscribe and click the bell. Andrew walked out of the registry office and breathed in the fresh air. That's it, he's free now. Only did he need this freedom. The man slowly raised his head and looked up at that piece of sky, which hung between high-rise buildings with a blue spot. Yes, there is freedom in the sky, and here there are cars, houses, hustle and bustle. Hurrying, running somewhere, always chasing your bird of fortune. So he was always running, running, and didn't notice how his life was gone. The most important thing was love. And was it? Now he didn't even know. No, and now he was not free, but lonely. He and Emily had met at some party. He's an aspiring businessman. She's an aspiring actress. A spark immediately ran between them, and six months later, they had a wedding in one of the best restaurants in the city. Andrew may have wanted to make it simple, but could he tell his beloved about it? After all, Emily waited for a fairy tale, and she got it. And then family life began. Of course, Andrew had envisioned it a little differently, that his wife would be waiting at home with dinner on the table and all that. But it turned out differently. Emily was at the theater till night on weekends with her bohemian crowd. No hot dinner, no warm bed. To all my husband's reproaches I said one thing. I have to find a producer. There's no other way in our profession. You cannot pay me the main role. They had some fights and scandals. But Andrew loved his spoiled girl too much, so he continued to tolerate. And also in the soul played glorious notes when he appeared at receptions with a beautiful wife. All the guests' jaws dropped. That's what his wife was like. A few years passed. While Andrew was firmly on his feet, he was able to expand the business, find partners investors. And now his construction company was the most famous in town. There came a time when there was no need to look for producers either. Andrew could pay for everything himself, and he did. And Emily shone in the theater, a few times even starred in some TV soap operas. His wife was happy, and Andrew was happy, but something was missing. They'd moved into their mansion by then, a full staff of servants, money was tight, and still something was missing. Andrew understood what the children were missing. But at first Emily found good arguments, say, while she is young, you need to play more roles, so that she will be remembered by the children. But a little later, of course, and she kept dragging and dragging. At first Andrew agreed with her, then there was a slight bewilderment. How long should we wait? It's been 10 years already. The bewilderment turned into displeasure, and then into anger. My wife doesn't want kids at all. Scandals became more and more frequent. And then one day, Andrew gave her an ultimatum, baby or divorce. Emily agreed, but it didn't work out. And that's when they went to the clinic. The doctors were all hands on deck. Emily couldn't get pregnant at all. All to blame for the termination of pregnancy, which she did in her distant youth from her classmate. She confessed this to Andrew only after the doctor's verdict. Andrew felt betrayed. All these years he'd waited, hoped, and here it was. No, he didn't blame Emily. She'd done something stupid when she was young, so what now? But he should have confessed sooner. After all, medicine is not standing still. He continued to hold out hope. They were advised to go to IVF specialists, and there they had hope. How happy Andrew was. And Emily? Well, she pretended to be happy, although she was often thoughtful. She was the first to speak to the surrogate mother. Andrew didn't want to hear it at first, but Emily convinced him again. Honey, you understand, if I have such problems, can I bear our child after Echo? I mean, the doctors themselves say there's a 50 50th chance I'll get pregnant. I mean, I'd have to undergo excruciating procedures, take hormones and not the fact that it will help, and I'll break up and become ugly. Not to mention I'd have to give up my profession, but you won't like me anymore either. I'll always like you, Andrew assured her, sweetie. That's what you're saying now. When I'm 100 pounds, it's like a promise. You'll talk differently. And Andrew agreed. No, not because the prospect of his wife's unpleasant transformation frightened him. He didn't believe it would be like that. He just didn't want his beloved to be tortured with drugs and procedures. They spent a long time choosing a surrogate. And finally they found a young girl. 
Maria was from the countryside in the city, worked as a hairdresser. She had a daughter, whom she gave birth to from a classmate, six months after graduation. They wanted to get married, but didn't have time. He left to serve. She promised to wait for him. And when she gave birth to her Nancy, the news of her husband's death and a hot spot came. His mother was raising him alone. A week after the terrible news and died, Maria, too, had only counted on her mother. Their father abandoned them a long time ago and left for parts unknown. And when Nancy was three years old, doctors made a terrible diagnosis. The girl had a serious heart defect. You only live to be 10 years old with a heart defect like that. That's if you don't get an operation. You can wait for years for a quota. For an urgent operation, the sums required were unbelievable. You can't earn that kind of money in their village. Not in the city either. But Maria looked for a way and found it. She decided to become a mom. She honestly told Andrew about her situation. He got into the story and immediately paid the money, even though it was not according to the rules. How grateful Maria was. Her daughter underwent surgery. The baby was left in her grandmother's care and Maria moved into Andrew and Emily's mansion. She worked hard to fulfill the terms of her contract. The pregnancy was easy. A boy was due. Maria meticulously followed the doctor's orders. She took walks, drank vitamins, listened to classical music. In the evenings, Andrew was interested in her affairs, and Maria gladly told about the events of the day. Emily was also sometimes present at these conversations, but she was obviously not interested. She was in her own thoughts, a new production, a new script, but only as time went on did she become thoughtful and even angry. She was annoyed by Maria's talk and vitamin hemoglobin oxygen level fetal heartbeat. Emily tried to shift all of Andrew's attention to herself. Why don't you stop, girls? She said to him, gently kissing his slit. Let him rest a little more and dragged him away. There was no sign of trouble. She, it turned out, was guarding nearby. That time, Andrew had gone to a neighboring town to a new facility. Emily called already closer to evening. Through his sobs, he did not immediately realize what had happened. When it came to him, he became cold with horror and grief. Maria was missing, and a day later, when Andrew excited and confused returned home, they received a call from the police. Outside of town, they found a burned-out car with the exact license plate number Maria had left in the passenger compartment, the charred corpse of a pregnant woman. They never found the cabbie. What happened? no one could understand. There was no doubt that it was marshy, blood type matched. They found a purse with a burnt passport. Yeah, it was Maria. Andrew was devastated. He had so much hope for the child this poor girl would bear and give birth to. And then disaster struck. It was necessary to deal with the funeral, and as it turned out, Andrew's urgent presence was required at the facility in the neighboring city. Emily convinced him to go. She promised to take care of all matters with the delivery of the body to Maria's homeland. Andrew was so grateful to his wife, how she was holding on. Good for her. After making sure the police were on the case, he left. He returned a week later. How empty and lonely was their mansion now? Andrew had grown very attached to Maria during that time. Yes, he missed that sweet girl with the growing belly. Andrew himself didn't realize what it was. Probably just as a future father, he was anxiously waiting for the appearance of his miracle. But he did not wait. Emily was surprisingly calm. She was only upset that so much money had been wasted. Not for nothing, Andrew told her at the time. We helped Maria's daughter, though it's scary to imagine the cost. Oh, you're getting sentimental. Emily grinned. Come on, let's forget it like a bad dream. And Andrew agreed especially since the details of that terrible story never appeared. The police filed the unsolved cases in the archives. Time passed. It took three years for him to dare to talk about the icon again. And again, Emily resisted. Andrew persuaded her that his age was no joke. He was in his 40s and she was in her 40s. It's time. This time it's definitely going to work out. Only now they won't let their mom go anywhere alone. And there's no telling what would have happened if Andrew hadn't caught Emily in their bed with her driver's young lover. Hired by him. 
At first, Emily cried and swore that it was a one-time thing, that she loved Andrew. And then the same driver confessed that he had been sleeping with his wife for six months, and before that she had an affair with the director, and even earlier with a colleague on the stage. And before that, Andrew had horns like a marshal. And the annoying thing is, he never noticed. How so? He couldn't live with that woman anymore. Some childish betrayal Andrew wouldn't forgive. So he filed for divorce. Didn't leave her with one suitcase, gave her a nice payoff. She won't need anything, but he can't see her anymore. Yes, a lot has been lived, a lot has been experienced. But how many lies have there been? And Emily, realizing that she was a very wealthy lady, was not at all upset by the divorce. She's free now. Good, rich. No need to have kids. And so two years passed after the divorce. Andrew lived alone. He wouldn't let any women near him. Although many beauties sighed at the sight of a wealthy, handsome man, he devoted himself to his work. What changed in his character? The formerly good-natured, understanding boss was now a dry man sugar. Tough, principled, demanding. He was wounded right in the heart, and it wound up. Everything in his office had to work like clockwork, and no one had the right to disrupt this work. Employees in the office were afraid of being late and were not delayed for a minute in the morning at lunch. Not to mention reports and projects that were issued strictly on schedule. Kate worked for Andrew as a secretary. She knew him from before and now a striking change. So surprised her, but had to conform. It was so hard though. Kate had a daughter growing up as well. Anna went to the preparatory group at the kindergarten until two years ago. Sometimes Kate could bring her daughter to work with her if the kindergarten was on quarantine and her husband was on a business trip. Now she had to make it work. Andrew kept a strict rule. No outsiders should be there, especially not children. The last proviso concerned Kate. He paid enough money, so to break this rule was the height of insanity. That day everything went wrong. Andrew's reception desk received a call from the watch, asking Kate to come down. She saw a young woman and a little boy about five years old. The woman was so thin that Kate involuntarily thought, is she sick? Excuse me, said the stranger timidly. Your white Andrew's secretary. Yes, Kate nodded and stared at the woman. Please take the boy to him. The woman's voice trembled. She held out at the runaway and immediately clutched the child convulsively to her. Then, squeezing his hands lightly, pushed him Kate. This is his son. Son Kate's eyebrows stopped somewhere in the middle of her forehead. But it's his son. The stranger interrupted her and held out an envelope. Give it to him. He'll read it and understand. She lowered her eyes, then rushed to the boy, hugged him, kissed him, and rushed away to the exit. The boy ran after her, but then, as if he remembered, he turned back to Kate. Auntie, take me to Papa, he said, and timidly stretched out his skinny little hand. Well, let's go, Kate replied confusedly, looking in the wake of the fleeing woman. Spun and envelope, Kate shrugged called out to her by the security guard who had heard the whole conversation. Maybe the police should be called. Let Andrew decide, the girl replied, looking thoughtfully at the child. She caught herself thinking that the kid really looked a lot like her boss. She took the boy's hand and they headed for the elevator. How would I like to see my boss's confused face? Chuckled, and a little gloated to herself Kate. You can't take the kids to work. Here's a present for you in the waiting room. Kate sat the boy down on the visitor's couch, gave him a pen and a piece of paper. The child looked distraught, trying with all his might not to cry. Apparently, his mother's sudden departure had upset him very much. But he held on. What's your name? Baby? Kate asked and stroked the boy's head. Then barely audible, he whispered. What a good name you have. Smiled at the secretary, and then came out of her pocket and took a risk. Here's some candy. Thank you. Just as quietly the boy said, took the candy, unwrapped the wrapper, sent the candy into his mouth, and looked around for a trash can to throw away the wrapper. Come on. Kate held out her hand, noting what a well-mannered boy he was. I wonder, Kate thought to herself, minding her own business, and occasionally glancing in Ben's direction. 
how it is that our crystal clear was able to make a baby on the side. The baby is about five years old, like my daughter or so. So Andrew was married then and divorced his wife because she betrayed him and cheated on him. Andrew's a real piece of work himself. And that girl in the lobby, she was a mouse. And how God looked at her. His wife Emily was 1,000 times more interesting. Ben was scribbling away on a piece of paper. Kate was tapping away at her keyboard. Everyone was busy doing their own thing. When the door to the waiting room opened, the woman and the boy turned their heads at the same time. Kate blushed a little when she saw Andrew, as if he could overhear her thoughts. And Ben was timid at the sight of a strange uncle. Froze like a sparrow. Chick. Andrew looked from Kate to the boy. His eyebrows raised in surprise. What does that mean? Finally, he said rather stiffly. Kate, you know that children are not allowed in our office. And if you have no one to leave your child with, we'll have to say goodbye. Kate, hearing such words, only smiled and shrugged her shoulders. Andrew, it's not my child. Especially, I have a girl. And whose is it? The woman who called me downstairs said it was yours. Hearing this, Andrew's eyes widened. Mine? What nonsense is that? She left an envelope, said you should read it. Kate held out the envelope. Inwardly jubilant. No, she used to be nice, but lately he's been like a soulless machine. So there you have it. Andrew took the envelope, visibly worried, looked at the boy something trembled in his face. Did he also notice that the kid looked exactly like him in his childhood photos, or is he confused and all children look alike in some way? So let him sit here, I'll be right back. Andrew jerked open the door to the study, as if apologizing. I repeated now the door slammed shut behind him. Kate smiled at Ben, who was clearly frightened. What's with the uncle slamming doors? It's okay, kid, it's going to be okay, winked the woman, and really wanted to ask the boy where his mom went, but she was afraid that the boy would pay, and it's none of her business. Let him figure it out for himself, looking for his mama by Ben's ear. Andrew plopped down in his chair, twirled the envelope. Just three words. Andrew White. What nonsense. He finally opened the envelope, unfolded the sheet, and his eyes quickly ran over the smooth, neat letters. From the first lines he was literally numb to what he was reading. As he read on, he felt like he was going crazy. Hello Andrew. I'm sorry I couldn't meet you in person. Yes, what you did back then was wrong, but I should have been grateful to you. You saved my daughter by paying for the surgery, but I couldn't give you my son, especially when I found out. I think you know what I mean. I'm sorry. I thought I could raise two kids on my own, and I could. Well, damn disease. I'm probably gonna die soon. She kind of takes care of my mom, but she's old. And I'm afraid that after I die, Ben might be taken away to an orphanage. So I'm giving him to you, Ben, your son, no doubt about it. You can do a DNA test, please. Raise him to be a decent human being. Maria Holiday. Andrew reached the end, and his forehead covered with a light vapor. This is some kind of monstrous spectacle. Maria Holiday is the same girl who five years ago was supposed to give birth, and Emily and I a son, but she died. He saw the case files himself at the morgue for some things. He and Emily identified her. Blood type, gestational age, everything matched. And then there's this. No, someone's playing a practical joke on him. Or is this a scam? Andrew reached for the phone to call the police. But suddenly his hand froze. What if it's true? Just then Maria ran away, faked her own death. But who was helping her? She couldn't have done it alone. And what the hell could she know about? What the hell could she know that he should know too? The man looked questioningly at the door. In the waiting room sat a toddler who really looked like him. Andrew had definitely discerned that. How was that possible? In any case, there were more questions than answers. And something had to be done. Yes, the DNA procedure would answer the big question. He went out into the waiting room and approached the boy, sat down on the couch. The little boy looked up startled. Are you my daddy? Quietly he whispered. Andrew shrugged his shoulders. I don't know how to answer the child. So you Ben is your name, where's your mom Ben? She exclaimed boy, she's gone. Mom said she had to go to the hospital. And while I'm staying with you, 
Mommy told me to behave, not to cry. What's your mom's name? Maria. And then the child could not stand it, and tears spurted from his eyes in three streams. Andrew ineptly embraced the boy, stroked his head. What's wrong? Confusedly asked him. Everything will be all right. We'll go to my place now, and then we'll decide what to do. Kate silently watched from the side and only wondered. The boss was suddenly speaking so kindly, so humanly. And it was her old boss, as she knew him before. And having made the necessary arrangements, Andrew Ranks left the office, leaving the employees only to wonder what kind of a boy is this? The office buzzed like a beehive. No one expected that Boas could have fathered a son on the side. No one even remembered the surrogate mother. Few people knew about it, though. Before starting proceedings, Andrew decided to find out if the child was his. He and the boy went to the clinic to take a DNA test. The result would be back in 10 days, said the nice girl, the lab technician. In 10 days, unpleasant, Andrew wondered. No sooner. It meant 10 days of waiting. Or maybe we should take the kid to a shelter. Let them sort it out themselves. And if his mother is the same Maria, do not have to find out for themselves. The mansion was surprised to see the owner so early and with a child. Andrew, what is it? The maid Jenna asked shyly. Something has happened, Andrew sighed. I don't know what it is yet. Feed the boy, keep him busy. I'll have to find out something. Jenna didn't ask any more questions, just nodded her head. Andrew went into the office, found some old papers. Among them must have been a copy of Maria's passport. It's definitely there. Andrew looked at the registration in some backwoods, wanting to be surprised. It would have taken him 24 hours to get there. But before he went looking for Maria, he went to the police. He had to find out the details of the unsolved case, who was actually found. He was sure Maria was dead, but Emily was more in touch with the police at the time. He had an urgent job to do. The investigator listened to Andrew and raised his eyebrows in surprise. And I was on the case at the time, and I remember it well. Yes, you identified the corpse as Maria, but then new details came to light. The investigator said that Maria was found alive and well in the village. She just filed a report about the loss of her passport. We called your wife. We couldn't reach you. She said she'd pass everything on to you. Nothing was passed on. Andrew shook his head. Was that for? No. No. I called you later and asked you how things were going. What else could I say? I said I didn't know anything. But why didn't you tell me about Maria? The investigator's eyes ran strangely. He lowered his head and then firmly said that he had so much work that he didn't have to talk about the same thing 20 times. Slammed the door. He walked out of the office. He didn't like that investigator. To hell with him. The main thing was that Maria was really alive, and now it was necessary to find her so that she could personally explain everything to him. What's the big deal? Did he know what she was running from? And then he stopped. Another thought adored him. It turns out Emily knew Maria was alive and was hiding it. What the hell was that? He had to talk to his ex-wife right away. But her phone was silent. And when he arrived at the apartment, he bought Emily himself as a payoff. He didn't move any further from the locked door. He pounded on the door in vain, rang the bell. What are you guys doing in the hallway? An old woman looked out of the apartment across the hall. I'll call the police. And only from there, Andrew answered tiredly. Do you know where the mistress is? And who are you? Ex-husband's ex. Emily has been gone for a week, as if on vacation somewhere in the Arab Emirates. The grandmother looked at Andrew with some gloating. She found herself a good man. He is her boss and loves her very much, so they left together. I'm glad for her, she grinned. Andrew replied. I don't know when she will arrive, she doesn't report to me. Andrew went down the stairs, and the neighbor woman muttered something else in his wake. She left such a nice woman, and now she's running away. And Emily is beautiful, he plays in soap operas, he came to his senses, but it's too late for him. All these men are the same. Andrew from Emily's house went to a children's store and asked the saleswoman to pick out clothes for a boy of about five years old. He such on his fingers explained Andrew. The girl understood, nodded, smiled. 
and soon two full bags of clothes were lying on the cash register. Maybe some more toys, the girl suggested. And I do not know what at this age they are interested in. Andrew wondered. And his gaze stopped on Ben in the tank. No, that's for toddlers. Following his gaze, the girl laughed. Here look here cars, robots, airplanes. We have new models or helicopters with remote control. I think your boy will be delighted. I got mine. He and my husband almost got into a fight. And my husband loved it. He's the same boy, only 30 odd years old. I'm sure you'll love it too. Come on. Andrew bought some helicopters, some cars, and a couple of obscure robots. Already leaving the store, laden with packages. He sadly thought of Ben how much he missed. Yes, rattles of pyramids, it is probably also so interesting. The final cord was a trip to the pastry shop, where Andrew bought a huge cake, when he got home with all his purchases. Jenna the maid gasped. How much is that? And Lucy the cook was even a little offended. She can't bake a cake like that by herself. And it's bad for the boy to eat sweets, she grumbled. I fed him chicken soup, and cutlets, and some compote. He ate it all, smiled Andrew. Yes, covered like a sparrow chick, sighed Lucy. Youth is a good boy in general. Andrew, will you clarify so that we understand this is your boy, Lucy? I don't know yet, Andrew shook his head. The cook nodded her head understandingly, though she honestly didn't understand anything. And neither did Jenna, who preferred to mind her own business. But she was honestly practicing with the boy. She even enjoyed talking to him. Such a sweet, well-mannered child. And so much like his master. What's the story? Everyone was interested, but they minded their own business. Ben was watching cartoons in the living room, laughing at the adventures of the heroes. He didn't notice anyone around him. The little boy seemed to have forgotten what he had been through. Or maybe he was just distracted by seeing Andrew. The smile slipped off his face. Hello, he whispered shyly. Hello, Andrew smiled, lightly touched his head, stroked it. God, what silky hair and eyes, as if he were looking at his little self. Andrew swallowed the sudden lump in his throat. What expertise is there in this? He can already see that the boy his Andrew sat down next to the child. Are you watching cartoons? Barely audible, answered the child. Ben, what are you doing? Andrew was surprised. Are you afraid of me or what? I don't know, admitted the boy. Don't be afraid, I won't hurt you. Andrew put his arm around the boy's shoulders. Listen, I need to talk to my mom. Do you know where to find her? I don't know. Where did you live? That's the name of the village on Maria's passport. Who did you live with? With mom, grandma, Nancy, miss. Andrew looked sympathetically at the boy. Well, nothing, brother. Don't worry. Everything will get better. I bought so many things there, by the way. Come on, let's go look. And some toys, just like the clerk at the children's store said. Ben liked the helicopter the best. His eyes lit up. A smile appeared on his face. Andrew also liked launching the plastic machine. In short, they had a lot of fun. They almost broke the expensive vase in the living room and it would have broken. No big deal. Andrew was laughing. And with him Ben, who now was not afraid of this big strange uncle, whom mom said to call dad. The servants, on the other hand, were in mild shock. They had never seen Andrew before. The fool was learning like a boy to put a boy to bed in the evening. Andrew was reading a story aloud for the first time in his life. With such pleasure he, turning the pages, himself immersed in the adventures of the Tsarevich of the Grey Wolf. Ben's eyes were closing. Sleep, son. Andrew whispered and adjusted the blanket. Son, what a sweet word it turns out to be. And that night he slept the sweet sleep of a baby and woke up the next morning with a clear understanding of what to do next. We should go there awkwardly and right now. Settle things at work, leaving Ben in the care of Jenna. He went to find Maria. He could have taken the train, but Andrew decided to drive halfway, rest in a roadside hotel. And then on his way, driving with confidence. He couldn't forget the goodbye vote. Are you leaving me sobbing too? Asked the boy. Don't go away. You and I played so well. I'm back. Baby. Andrew hugged the boy and gave him a ringing kiss on the cheek. A few days. And we'll be together again. 
Yes, now Andrew was sure that he would not part with the boy. It's his son. DNA results aren't back yet. What's he gonna see in there? Ben is his son. He can feel it. Miranda's grandmother got up early that morning. She needs to make pancakes, granddaughter. She likes them very much. Nancy has a big event at school today. Her granddaughter is participating in a recitation contest. She's learned a nice long poem about friendship, about loyalty to Maria. She picked it up together and taught it. But my daughter had to leave, and Ben took it with her. The elderly woman sighed heavily, wiped away a running tear. Why are they so unlucky? She and Maria, herself all her life alone my cola and daughter had to Maria in general, it is not clear why all this punishment. After all, good, sweet, never hurt anyone in her life, had to face such problems. Oh, what will happen? Will she never see her grandson again? She didn't shed tears. Why did they have to go through such an ordeal? Oh, Maria, I wish the Lord had heard the mother's prayers and took the trouble away from her blood. The old woman sighed heavily. She wiped away her tears. Oh, and sighing, where from the pain of physical pain that all the joints were twisted, where from the pain of mental pain, she began to make pancakes. Soon a little distracted and deftly flipped pancakes on the frying pan. Hi, Grandma. A blonde-haired girl of about 10 years old looked into the kitchen. How good does it smell in here? Miranda's grandmother shouted quite a bit. There's a stack of pancakes waiting for you. Let's get cleaned up and get to the table. It's almost time for school. I put on your eye uniform yesterday and made you some bows. We'll put the bows on. Of course, the teacher said that the dress uniform nodded the girl. Soon Nancy was happily eating, and Miranda's grandmother was admiring her granddaughter. She's growing up to be a beauty. She looks like Maria. Batchy will come to look at me drinking the last pancakes with a huge frank tea. Asked Nancy. Of course I'll support you, my love, but don't worry. Read like you learned with your mama. Yes, with mom. Nancy lowered her head, trying to hide the tears that didn't run. Grandma. Do you think mommy will come back? She would. Miranda nodded vigorously. I pray for that every day. Ben, maybe she shouldn't have taken him with her. Granddaughter, mommy's right. It's better this way. We'll get together. We'll all still be together. She's wiping her tears now. It was Miranda's grandmother's turn, but she quickly came to her senses and with difficulty got up from the stool from the hall to the room. I had to get my granddaughter ready for school. After crossing her grandson in her wake, the old woman knelt for a long time on sick knees near the little icon. What was her heart praying for? What was her soul crying about? And Nicholas the Wonder Worker nonchalantly looked down from the icon, listened and realized if he could help. Only the Lord God could decide. It came out in the process. After calming down, Grandma Miranda headed off to school. Nancy was at her best today. And not surprisingly, the girl received first place for reciting a poem in her age group. Returning grandmother and granddaughter from school. Proud Nancy carefully clutched the winner's diploma and looked joyfully at Grandma Tonia. It would be to call mom now to please her, said the girl. It would be good, sighed the old woman, but you can't get through. There's no connection there. Yes, I know. So they talked, they reached their yard, and they both froze in bewilderment. There was a fancy car at the gate. An unfamiliar, tall, dark bald man got out of it and walked towards them. Hello, he said. Tell me please, Maria Holiday lives here. Who are you? Miranda's grandmother asked a little puzzled, looking at the stranger and his car warily. My name is Andrew White. I'm an acquaintance of Maria's. I'd like to talk to her. Andrew White. The old woman gasped and clutched at her heart. That's the one. Well, I don't know if it's the same one or not. Andrew was confused by the old woman's reaction. You know Maria is my daughter, the old woman confessed. My name is Miranda. Why did you come here? She left for you and Ben took her to you. That's why I'm here. I can't understand anything. Where is Maria? Andrew answered impatiently. I need her to explain everything to me personally. All these years I thought I didn't have a child. And now I have a son. Get Maria. No, Miranda answered quietly. You really don't know anything I don't know. 
Andrew shouted, and almost pitifully added, Explain it to me. Let's go inside. Sighing, the old woman replied, I need a break. Nancy, run. Opens the door the girl with curiosity, looked at the unfamiliar uncle, ran and forward into the yard. The old woman and her guest followed her. Andrew looked around with interest. Lord, how shabby is everything here? The fence is swaying. Some kind of building at the back of the yard. Probably a barn. The roof was hanging off it. And the house itself is old. I guess there's no man's hand here and no money. Although clean grass you cash in in the yard flowers in the flower beds, in the house also did not smell of wealth. Everything is old, but neat. Grandmother Miranda escorted the guest to the kitchen, sat him down at the table, put the kettle on herself. She was silent. Andrew was also silent. Both didn't know how to start a conversation. Nancy looked in and immediately ran away. That's Maria's daughter. I remember her talking awkwardly, Andrew asked. Yes, that's our Nancy. Thanks to you she lives with a sigh, replied Miranda. But at least you did a good deed. Why did you do this to my girl? As Andrew cried out, it was only fair. You know about surrogacy. I know, I was against it at first, but Nancy had to be saved. I agreed to do it with my daughter on my own dime. Who knew you'd cheat her like that? Ben is our joy though. Everything was fair, she's carrying our baby. And we were counting on what she did. Ran off and faked her death and faked her death. The old lady sat on the stool pale with surprise. Maria definitely didn't do anything like that. I would have known. You're slandering her. But you and your wife took advantage of a stupid girl. How did we take advantage? Maria realized she was acting as, excuse me, an incubator for our baby, and she basically took it for herself. That's how it works. And that's after we paid her. You really don't know anything, do you? The old woman said thoughtfully. Would you ask your wife then? I can't. We divorced her and she left. And then I got an incomprehensible letter from Maria at work. You can't imagine the shock I felt. I thought Maria and the baby died in that car. I don't know anything about the car. But about Maria and the baby. Look if you don't know. My daughter told me everything when she came back to the village with a belly, crying on my shoulder. And I listened and cried too. These rich people. Why do they think they can do anything? Yes, speak, Andrew pleaded and Miranda's grandmother began her story. On surrogacy, Maria was desperate. She had to save her daughter. And to be honest, she didn't fully realize the gravity of what she was doing. She'd made her mind up. The child she would carry was someone else's yes incubator, but she would do anything to save Nancy. When Andrew paid for the surgery while still early in the pregnancy, Maria idolized him. It was a miracle. The young woman vowed to herself that she would never do anything bad to him, and the baby would be born and given to him. Time passed, the baby developed, everything was fine. Andrew turned out to be a wonderful man. He took an interest in Maria's affairs. They often talked in the evenings, about nothing. Maria noticed that Andrew's wife Emily was tense, but she was calm about it. There was nothing between her and Andrew. That Emily takes little interest in the child, so not herself, because she carries him for Maria's sake, and their awakened maternal instincts. But the maternal instinct woke up, Maria's own. The more the term became, the more she realized how hard it would be for her to give the baby to the one who was now under her heart, a foot, under her ribs pushing, turning over in her belly. But she remembered the most important thing, the baby was not hers. She had already gotten a settlement for it. Her baby girl is alive and well. That morning, Andrew left on business for another city. Maria was going to the clinic for another checkup. Emily was going to drive her. When Maria was ready to enter the room, the landlady came in. Gathered somewhat dismissively, she asked Emily. Well, yes, I'm ready, ready. Hung the woman and went into the room. Closed the door behind her. She stood in front of Maria and stared at her mockingly, crossing her arms over her chest. So you are ready to give us your child. Maria was confused. It's your baby. It's your baby, you fool. Emily grinned. Fertilized your egg, not mine. What do you mean? There's a contract. Maria's heart raced like a robo chick. That's exactly the deal. And you're gonna give us the baby anyway. 
Is that what you want? And I don't believe you. I'm gonna get Maria. I feel like she's about to choke with excitement. Calm down, you'll give birth before your time. Anyway, the case was like this. And Emily told that during the examination it turned out that her eggs are not vital. And it was worth a lot of work to persuade the doctor not to inform Andrew about it. She paid a considerable sum to have the doctor perform all the manipulations on Maria's eggs. At that moment, Emily thought it was the most correct decision. Andrew was on edge. He wanted children. If it didn't go well, he would just leave Natalia. And when your belly started growing, I realized I couldn't lie to the man I loved for the rest of my life, Emily said. I told him everything. And what? Maria looked at the woman with eyes full of horror. He laughed foolishly and called me. He said it didn't matter whose egg was whose. The only thing that matters is that it's our child. And even if you ever found out the truth, he'd hire the best lawyers, and you still wouldn't be allowed near the baby. Laughter. Theatrically, Emily. Yeah, that's what he's like. Why are you telling me this now? Maria whispered. I could have known nothing. Now you know, and decide for yourself, shrugged Emily. You understand? And I realized that I would never love that child. This whole eco thing was my husband's idea. We've lived together for so long and will continue to do so. Why do I need diapers and diapers? I was made for love and the stage. It's all so drab. Anyway, so I thought I'd give you a chance to get away with it. Do you want this baby? Of course I do. I'm carrying it around in my heart, not knowing it's mine. I loved him more than my life. And now I can't give him up. Maria said that quietly. Are you telling the truth? Oh my God. Of course I'm telling the truth. And Andrew knew it was my baby. Of course I confess to him. It doesn't matter to him who the mother is. What matters is that we're gonna be together. Don't you hear me? I don't want a baby. Go to your own damn place and live there and raise it. You got the money and the baby's a bonus. Andrew, he'll look for it and he'll find it. Don't worry about that. I've got it all figured out, but it's none of your business. And Maria agreed with Natalia. On the way to the train station, they stopped by the clinic just in case. And the same doctor confirmed Emily's words. Yes, Maria was carrying her baby. Yes, she could have made a scene. But what would she have accomplished? The baby would have been taken away from her anyway. And now that she knew the truth, she couldn't just give it away. So she decided to go back to her mother in the village. She was very hurt that Andrew had done that to her. When he knew the truth, he could have talked to her. Maria thought they had a relationship of trust, but they didn't. What did she expect though? He loves his wife. Yes, Maria was afraid to admit to herself that she had managed to fall in love with Andrew. And now a cruel disappointment awaited her. She would hide, disappear, dissolve. Emily, I bought her a ticket myself, put her on the train, and Maria went home with a baby under her heart. Her own baby. In the village, when they saw Maria with a belly, people were talking, wondering who had given Maria the baby. I guess she'd been twirling her tail in town, so I screwed it up. It's just a matter of life though. Maria wasn't the first or the last, but at least she had one trailer. Now it's two. But Miranda was more or less healthy at the time. She fought back, took a bite out of her glasses. That's it. Gossip Girl gave birth to a healthy boy Ben at term and named him Ben. And all these years she raised her children. She put her heart and soul into them. Nancy loved her little brother too. She became such a wonderful nanny. And Antonina was relieved. I guess that town girl kept her word. They're not looking for Maria. The only thing is that when she was pregnant, she went to the district center to get her passport restored. It took a long time, but then they gave her new documents. Where did you lose your passport? Maria couldn't remember. Probably when she was traveling home on the train through the village, she didn't have time for a passport. Time passed. Maria took the counting courses at the district employment center. She got a job in the office. At the same time, she entered the institute by correspondence. Home, children, work, study. I was terribly tired, but nothing I managed. And Miranda helped around the house. Although over the years, my legs began to hurt terribly. Doctors diagnosed Arthur, and it's hard to cure it. 
and it takes a lot of money. And diabetes got attached to the old woman. In short, the diseases clung to her. How was she? Maria had to do more and more herself at home and in the vegetable garden. It's good that my mom at least cooks. And then she got so wake that she could hardly get out of bed in the morning. I thought it was from overexertion, from fatigue. I bought some vitamins, but they don't help. I went to the district hospital. There at first also sang about avitaminosis and daily regimen. And then Maria's tests came back and the doctor suspected something more serious in the city she was sent. It turned out that Maria has a tumor in her head, which can only be told after surgery. Although the doctors averted their eyes, saying that by all accounts the tumor is malignant. And even if we do the operation, there's little chance. And I need a lot of money for treatment. Where do you get them? From a single mother with two children, with a sick mother to boot. Maria soon realized that her business wasn't good enough, what to do? The young woman imagined, like the orphan, these were her children. And what then? Take them to an orphanage. They'll take them away. Mama's sick, she won't let her have custody. And Nancy feels sorry for Ben and myself a little bit. I came across an article on the internet about an old man who lives somewhere in Dallas. He cures people, he's not a quack. Not everyone is taken for sure. But if he agrees, then a person must trust him completely to break contact with the world. A year or two passes and he comes back. The person is completely healthy. Maria told her mother about this article, yes. Fairy tales, our daughter, shook her head. Miranda, she just seffens off money, that's all. Where did I get the money from? He doesn't charge anything for treatment, Maria objected. They write a lot of good things about him on the internet. But how is it in practice? And in reality? Until I find out for myself, resolutely answered Maria. Mom, I've made up my mind. I'm going to look for this old man. Daughter, you're so weak, but you still have the strength to try. Well, maybe you'll agree to the operation. Doctors are not fools, they're not fools either. But they've already written me off, you know. Yesterday at the clinic I was taking pills, and the nurse and the doctor were talking about me. The nurse says holiday. We need to add more painkillers. And the doctor says yes, for two more months. And then it won't be necessary. Mom, you know? They knew I was sitting at the door, waiting for a prescription. That's what they said in town. They seem to agree to do the surgery, and then they add. But you're responsible for the outcome. Nobody's vouching for this kind of surgery. How's that? Oh, my daughter, what a grief, and how did you do it? Rhonda sobbed. It's okay, mommy. Let's hope for the best. We just have to do something about Ben. Miranda then raised surprised and crying eyes at her daughter and told her what she had thought up. Mom, you have to consider both options. What if I don't come back? The guardianship will come to you. I don't think they'll let you keep two kids. All right, Nancy, that's more. Maybe they'll agree. Ben will definitely be taken away to an orphanage. What are we gonna do? A son can't be an orphan with a living father. I'll take him to town to Andrew. He's his son. He won't do anything bad to him. Miranda was against it. How could she give her grandson to some uncle? Not happen. But Maria convinced her. She had already found out on the internet that Andrew is also a successful businessman. He's rich, and when he finds out he has a son, he should be happy. After all, he wanted him five years ago, Emily. But Andrew and Natalia must have divorced. Maria didn't read it on the internet. She wrote a letter to Andrew, in which she confusingly explained her action. And then she talked to Ben, told him he had a daddy and he would have to live with him. You cried. Oi, what about Nancy? What about Grandma? They'll come and see you later. Maria lied. She thought she was doing the right thing and so did I. I'll be back. I just need to recuperate a little in the hospital. Wiping away tears, specified Ben in the hospital. How to Maria. Don't worry. Will they love you there? I don't want to. I need to be with you. You can't be with me, son. But I promise you that I'll always be with you in my mind. Do you believe me? He didn't say anything. He just nodded and snuggled into his mom's fragrant hair. Yes, he would do as mom asked. The main thing is that she gets well. And he's an adult. He understands everything. He'll be patient. Maria and Ben went to the city. 
though she easily found the office of Andrew's firm and left her son. And then, hiding behind a tree not far from the office, watched carefully. She saw Andrew arrive. How then he came out of the bathroom and got into the car. That he would not hurt the child, she felt that with her motherly heart. And then Maria sobbed, sitting in the public garden. She had given her son away with her own hands. That's exactly what they wanted her to do. Five years ago, she couldn't do it then. Ran away, hid. But God must have punished her, and now she has to pay the bill. Maria called her mother and told her that Ben was with Andrew and everything was fine. Daughter, maybe you'll go to the hospital now. Didn't she ask, Miranda begged her? No, mom, I'll do as you decided on the wall. Kiss for me and tell her I love her very, very much. I promise I will do everything I can to get back to you. Barely holding back tears, Maria replied, Just don't call me. It will be easier for me. God bless you, my darling, my only daughter. Miranda sobbed. May everything work out for you. I'll pray for you. My darling. Thank you, mommy. That was the end of their goodbye. And Maria's cell phone was never answered again. It was out of range. Apparently, she turned it off so she wouldn't tear her wounded heart out. And Nancy and Miranda said that at the hospital, her mom just wasn't picking up her cell phone, but she would definitely call and it would get easier. And Nancy began to wait. She missed her mommy and her baby brother very much. But the girl believed that mom would be back soon, and so would Vanga. In the meantime, she will be the main helper of her grandmother to study well and please her with her successes. Andrew listened to what the old woman was telling him and could not believe that it was all true. How could it happen that his experienced businessman, intelligent man was so spent? And by whom? Emily? She got rid of Maria. But why? And then Andrew remembered his interactions with Maria. Their conversations and innocent jokes and smiles. He liked this girl for her simplicity, naivety, and purity. He was even flattered that his child was being carried by such a mother, a real mother. I remember he even asked Maria's permission several times to touch her belly, to listen to how the baby was turning there, moving a leg or a hand. Those were beautiful moments. One day, Emily saw such a scene and then made a scandal for Andrew. Like you're a surrogate trying to have an affair. What kind of affair? Emily didn't understand his feelings or the feelings of the father-to-be. He was just waiting for a miracle, but the miracle did not happen. Now Andrew understood why Emily was jealous of Maria, but she didn't show it. And when she realized that the situation could go further, she decided to act. Not but, had she persuaded the doctors at the hospital to go on the offense? Did Ben, really my son and son Maria, confusedly said when he listened to Antonina's story, so you knew nothing. Miranda was surprised already. What do you mean? Your wife deceived Maria, saying that you knew everything. I didn't know anything. If I had known, if I had known, I would never have taken the child away from the mother, and I would have helped always firmly answered Andrew. I wish Maria had talked to me then, although I realized she wouldn't have been allowed to. My wife came up with a very clever combination. Andrew began to guess that the story with the burnt-out car was not accidental either, and he had yet to find out everything. But that would come later. Tell me, how is Ben? Miranda asked pitifully. My heart bleeds for my grandson. Who did you leave him with? He's with my housekeeper Svetlana. Don't worry, she's a very nice person. She has children of her own. She knows how to communicate. She'll be fine. I bought him some toys, Lucy's clothes, my cook promised to cook all sorts of goodies. He likes dumplings. I heard Nancy's voice. The girl was standing at the door and, as it turned out, was eavesdropping. Nancy awed at the she. Tonya, why are you hanging your ears? But Ben's my brother. I should know. Nancy threw her head down. I'm worried too. Andrew turned to the girl and smiled confusedly. So this is the little girl he helped five years ago what a sweet little girl. How nice that everything worked out for her then. Don't worry. Andrew waved his hand at her. Come join us. It's not like we're strangers now. We should work things out together. Work what out? Careful. The girl asked. How can we help our mother? She's used to solving everything on her own. That's the way her life has turned out. 
She shouldn't have trusted me, but that's all right. We'll find her and help her. Nancy nodded confidently. The girl had been guessing for the last few days that her mother hadn't gone to the hospital. Something else. And then on the internet found her correspondence with some people who wrote to her elders, explaining how to find him. Nancy told Andrew about it, because she saw he was a good man, and Ben looked so much like him. Will you show me this correspondence? Asked Andrew. Okay, nodded the girl. It's all written there. We have to help. We'll figure it out, Andrew promised. And a couple hours later he left back to town. Said he'd bring Ben back soon. Or should he? He suddenly came to his senses. It's hard enough as it is. What are you? Miranda exclaimed, walking him to the gate. I only now realized what a foolish thing I'd done when I agreed to go with Maria. We'll manage together somehow. And don't worry about the guardianship. The examination will be ready soon. And no one will take anyone to the orphanage, Andrew promised. But don't get me wrong. I want to know for sure. Is Ben's baby Maria? How can I prove it to you now without her? Miranda splashed her hands. You can give me a toothbrush on the wall. If they are their own blood, then there are no more questions, Andrew replied. There were still doubts in his heart. Had he been deceived so cleverly at the clinic? Miranda's grandmother immediately rushed into the house and soon brought out a toothbrush. Girls, just like Andrew asked. Here's more Andrew pulled out his wallet and took out some large bills. Take these for the first time. I also want to send a construction crew to your place. I see you have no foundation, no walls to insulate. Winter's coming. Oh, what for? Miranda's grandmother was embarrassed. We can and should do it ourselves. You helped us so much with Nancy. It was a long time ago, smiled Andrew. Life goes on. And don't refuse help. You don't know who owes who. And he left. And Miranda's grandmother stood looking after the car. What a good man is Andrew. Yes, Ben has a decent father. I wish Maria would get well. Did thoughts of her daughter make the old woman sad again? She cried. Why was her beauty so unlucky? And now this disease. And where to find her? The first thing Andrew did in the city was to stop by the clinic where he did the DNA analysis and explained what he wanted. I see, nodded the girl lab technician. We'll do it, but it will take a little more time. Do everything as it should be done. Andrew agreed. Now he did not rush things. He just wanted to document everything, and his heart was already sure. Ben is Maria's own son, and his too. He arrived home while Ben was still asleep. Andrew marveled at the first hour of the day and the baby asleep. Jenna was embarrassed, then admitted yesterday she had let the boy watch cartoons late and then fell asleep herself. Anyway, when exactly he fell asleep, Ben, she doesn't know. Andrew, I'm sorry, but I've got a whole house and a baby to take care of. And I wanted to go to my family's house last night. I couldn't make it. And I've got kids growing up too. I can't work like this. Yeah, Jenna, I'm sorry, you're right. I've been putting too much pressure on you, Andrew agreed. I'll get a babysitter today, but it won't be for long. Soon I'll take Ben back to grandma's, to grandma's. Yes, Jenna. Well, there you go. Turns out I have a son, and he has a grandmother, a sister, and a mom. Only mom still had to be found. Having said that, Andrew went to his room to change his clothes. He had to go to the office, no time to rest, and Jenna remained standing there with her mouth open. The landlord seemed to be in trouble. Who is she? Ben's mom. What's the point of guessing? He'll find out in time. Andrew called Katya into his office first thing at work. After asking about business, he got to the important question. Kate, you have a child, don't you? Yes, a daughter. A little tense, Kate. Did someone snitched to the boss that yesterday I had to take a pipe burst? Andrew, you're not swearing. Only she wasn't bothering anyone here yesterday. She gave herself away. Worried, Kate told about the pipe, about the tutors, about the fact that her husband is on a business trip, and the nanny has another order. The supervisor only raised his eyebrows. Then he smiled at Kate. Don't worry, you are. I'm not asking because you brought your daughter here. Of course, it's against the rules. But we all have force major. It's fine. The daycare is open today. Yeah, Kate's jaw dropped at that answer from the chief. 
What's the big change? Kate, you said about a nanny. Can you tell me where to find a good one? I have to go to the agency for a few days. I don't want to go to an agency. I need a trustworthy one who really loves kids. I can recommend Kelly if they're leaving the duck. She's a good one. I just need to know if she can do it. You know, please, I have to go today. And it's literally just for a couple of days and preferably with accommodation. And if your little girl can't be left with anyone during that time, I can take her home with me. I can't take care of two people. Yes, you can. I'll call her now, and then, if anything, I'll give you her coordinates. Kate nodded. Then in the waiting room, she marveled at how the boss had changed in just 24 hours. He was again, as before, open, smiling, human. That kid must have had such an effect on him. And he's the one looking for a nanny. Kelly was available and agreed. Andrew didn't like it. A former teacher on a well-deserved vacation, but still quite lively, active, modern. They met within an hour of Kate's call and talked things over Ben should like it with her. Afterward, he set about finding Maria. First, he called all the hospitals. Maybe she changed her mind and went to the doctors after all. Or maybe she got sick on the street, but she was nowhere to be found. So she went to that old man in Dallas. Andrew did not believe in these tales of miracle cures and decided to go looking for Maria. He couldn't even explain to himself why. I mean, who is she to him? No one. No, she was the mother of his child. And he felt responsible for this poor young woman. She needs urgent medical attention. And he would pay whatever it took to treat her. And he also wanted to tell her, looking into her eyes, that he was not guilty of anything. Andrew looked at the picture he had taken from the laptop at Miranda's house. Maria's correspondence with other people on the internet. About that the elders figured out the route on the plane, and there will figure out where to look. Just need to settle all the affairs at the firm, so that during his absence everything works like clockwork. That'll take two days, and then we have to take him to his grandmother's bathhouse. Andrew understood that it was hard for the boy in an unfamiliar environment, even if he had the best nanny in the world. There's no one better than his grandmother and his little sister. Maria, why did you pull the kid out of his familiar environment? It's understandable though. She didn't believe in her cure, so she saved her son from the orphanage. And it was the right thing to do. Otherwise, Andrew would never have known the whole truth and lived a lie. Toward evening, Andrew stopped by the clinic to see a well-known oncologist. He had made an appointment with him in the morning. Andrew wanted to understand what was really wrong with Maria, because he had taken the medical documents from Miranda. Maria did not take them with her, and this once again confirmed Andrew's speculation that she had left for Dallas, not hoping to return. Just left so no one would see her torment. The old man is like a placebo. What if it helps? Ethan took a long look at Maria's scans. Read the transcripts. I can see why the woman was reluctant to operate. He said, after a little silence, the tumor is in a hard to reach place and there's a big risk of hitting the optic nerve. Plus it's not clear what kind of tumor it is. The girl's mother said the doctors were leaning towards malignant and the labs are bad. Headaches, weakness, it's all circumstantial. She needs surgery. Can you do that? I can do it. But I have a waiting list for a year. But doctor, please, Ethan thought about saying no to Andrew. He couldn't. After all, the new hospital building had been built thanks to the work of his interlocutor. I'm sorry, but this is a rather expensive operation. No, I will not take a penny, but the equipment materials. Finally, he said. I understand. Andrew interrupted him. I'll pay for everything. How much? The sum, of course, was decent. But Andrew was not embarrassed. Ethan was embarrassed when he heard that the patient had yet to be found. She's gone to Dallas, the doctor shook her head. But what kind of people are we? Why do they believe all this nonsense? Desperation, I guess. Your colleagues told her almost to her face that she was a goner. Andrew said, thank you for speaking up. You're welcome for now. You'll be sure to look for her. Time is not working in our favor. Andrew left the clinic both aggravated and worried. Yes, Maria can still be helped, but how do we find her? And that's when he decided to change his plans. He's taking the first flight to Dallas. 
Ben would have to live in his house without his grandmother and Nancy. Kelly watches him. Whatever Andrew says, Andrew pays her. And the business, it's working just fine as it is. He can manage without him. At night he puts Ben to bed, and Andrew kisses him gently on the top of his head. God, how wonderful is it to have a son. And in the morning he flew to Dallas and made all the necessary arrangements at work. On top of that, Andrew remembered to tell and pay for a construction crew to renovate Miranda's house. He promised. In the meantime, Emily was returning from vacation. The woman was a little disappointed with the trip. She had expected more from her new lover. He promised luxurious apartments, romantic walks on a yacht. Emily dreamed of not living on the seashore. You bet, because her next lover introduced himself to her in New York. Not just anyone, but an Arab sheikh. He came up to her after the performance and gave her a mind-blowing bouquet. So in love looked at her that Natalia just drowned in the black pool of his eyes. So she did the math. How much is his wristwatch worth? Everything in New York was great, the restaurants and the bed. Then Ahmed left, but he promised to send her a ticket to the Arab Emirates soon. He wanted to introduce Emily to his country, to his family. And he made some pretty transparent hints. I was proposing marriage, and when the email came with the plane ticket, Emily rejoiced. Fate had once again turned its beaming face on her. Things had been a little bleak lately. There were fewer and fewer roles and the money Andrew had left her was almost gone. Where had she spent it? Yes, on a young Alfonso who dumped her not so long ago. And then Ahmed. Yes, she still had everything ahead of her. What with all these soap operas and hackneyed shows. She's about to hit Hollywood. Ahmed's gonna help her. Well, on arrival in the Arab Emirates, everything was not so rosy. Ahmed didn't meet her at the airport. He sent a cab. She drove to the hotel, where Ahmed had rented a room for her. And it was far from five stars. Emily was in a state of mild shock. She waited for an explanation. It's okay. She's a star, a goddess. And he put her in some shack. Ahmed arrived in the evening and without unnecessary formalities, said that Emily would be his third wife. Now they will go to meet his family. Emily raised an uproar, but a blow to the solar plexus clearly tempered her ardor. Ahmed grabbed her like a sack of potatoes and dragged her out of the hotel. No one prevented him. Although Emily tried to shout for help, everyone around her pretended not to notice. Ahmed brought her to an ordinary three-room apartment where in one lived his two wives, in another four children, and in the third was his bedroom. That's when Emily realized that Ahmed is not a sheikh, but an ordinary office worker. He needed a third wife because the other two could not cope with the household. Four children and one of them is pregnant again. In broken Russian, Ahmed explained to Natalia that her duties would include washing dishes, laundry, cleaning, and sometimes sleep with him. Although you are old, he said with a chuckle, but once a month I'll let you be with me. Emily's indignation was unbounded. How so? She is an actress, a star, and her servant. And who is some obscure Arab? Emily tried to make a scene, even swung to slap Ahmed. But he was more faithful. And a moment later his wife blushed on Emily's cheek. She spent the night crying on a mattress thrown on the floor by one of Ahmed's wives. And in the morning the real horror came. Ahmed left for work, locking the door behind him. Four kids, ten to two years old. All the while yelling, jumping, laughing, sometimes crying. Ahmed's wives were minding their own business, not caring about raising the children, but soon the pregnant women, apparently deciding to be a little Makarenko or some other great pedagogue, sat the worker down and began to draw with them. And before that she brought and put a full basin of dirty clothes in front of Natalia, explaining with gestures that she should go to the bathroom and wash them. Yesterday's actress, who became in an instant the third wife, was in shock. Wanted to send this nasty woman, but realized that not only Ahmed can dissolve hands, and there are two of them here. She went to the bathroom to look for the washing machine. She was disappointed. There was no machine. She had to do the laundry by hand. Emily couldn't take it anymore. As she screamed angrily, grabbing a mop, the whole neighborhood must have heard. The wives must have gotten tired of her screaming. 
Then one of them took a key out of her pocket and opened the door. Emily realized she was being chased out, and that was salvation. But how do you find an embassy in a country when you are there for the first time, and without money, documents and phone? For a few days, Emily hobbled around to earn at least some money for food, helped washing dishes in some diner, and slept there. And then she went to the beach. That's where she met the drink peddler. He understood a little bit. He was a nice guy. He helped her get to the embassy. And now, finally, Emily's home in the Emirates. She won't tell anyone about it. It's just the way it was. And if they ask, she'll say she just didn't like Ahmed. Not her bird of preference. Already at home. Emily wondered how she was going to live her life. The money had run out. There was no offer of a movie. Working in the theater brought a small income. How could she spend all of Andrew's money so recklessly? She'd have to find a new lover. But the thought of their media sobered her. What if the new one was the forgotten old one? Yes, Andrew. Their divorce doesn't mean anything. I mean, he's always loved her. Divorced out of jealousy. But maybe he's calmed down now. Besides, Emily knew for a fact that Andrew was still single. Probably because he loves her. The conversation with the neighbor only convinced her that her thoughts were correct. She was just taking out the trash when the ubiquitous old lady from next door peeked out. Oh, Emily's back. She sang in a sweet voice. You look so much prettier than when you burned. Your vacation was good for you. Emily only nodded in reply. If the old woman knew what a vacation it was. And you alone. Where's that hot brunette? The one who brought you roses in armfuls winked the neighbor. And the brunette was not my type. Emily replied with dignity and went down the stairs. And really, why do you need him? I heard her say, maybe you're still sitting with your husband? What husband? Emily was surprised and turned to her neighbor. She certainly never reported about her marital status. Yes, he came to you, looking for you. He was tall, clean-shouldered, brunette too, but not as black as the one with the roses. Andrew was here. Emily smiled happily, not hiding her joy. He was, the neighbor nodded, and he was very upset when he found out you'd left. What did you say to him, you old fool? Emily suddenly kissed and stepped up the stairs. Why do you swear, Emily? I didn't tell him anything about that black man. I told him I'd gone on vacation and everything was exactly right. The neighbor even crossed herself and slammed the door. Emily exhaled. It is good that Andrew does not know anything about Ahmed. It would be easier to establish a relationship with him. All evening. Emily had been practicing her speech in front of Andrew, even practicing in front of the mirror. Yes, it was a very convincing portrayal of remorse. Yes, she cheated. But she realized it. And if Andrew allows to give her a second chance, then in their lives they will have a real fairy tale. She wants a baby. Yes, please. She still can, because no one can cancel. Emily had thought about the baby, of course. It was the last thing on her mind, just in case. And then she'd deal with the circumstances. Sprinkle ashes on her head in the morning. She dialed Andrew's number, and then she was disappointed. Andrew was unavailable for lunch. He appeared to be online. But as soon as Emily dialed, he was out of the area again and wherever he was. Emily decided to drive to his house at the same time and see how it was without her at the mansion. When the guard saw her at the entrance, he was speechless. Emily, alas. He muttered suddenly and smiled coquettishly at Emily. Andrew's at home. No, he's out of town. Oh, so I'll wait for him. She answered and walked past the guard, squeezing his shoulder. The huge man did not take any action. And who knows? Maybe they had already made up. There was no instruction to keep Natalia out, was there? Emily walked along the path to the house, noting that nothing much had changed here. It was still beautiful, solid, rich. So, she wanted to live here again. No one answered the door for a long time. Finally, the door opened, and Emily saw an old woman with a boy of about five years old. Who are you? Emily wondered. I'm not Kelly. The woman answered. Who are you? I'm Andrew's wife. Dropping her head, answered Emily and also pushed back with her shoulder, did not pass into the house. I don't understand what boy who's. 
and I realized that it is Andrew's son. Calmly answered Kelly, and if you are the wife, why don't you know? What business is it of yours? Emily replied confused and stared at the baby. A son. From where? I don't know. I'm sorry. Let me see some ID. Why would I do that? Emily exclaimed. Who the hell are you? Jenna came out, followed by Lucy. Oh my God, Emily. The cook gasped. What are you doing here? Andrew invited me. Emily lied without remorse. And a few days ago, I could only now come. Where is he? Jenna answered on Dallas. I went. He said something. Anyway, I'll stay here until my room is free, hopefully. And to the tacit approval of the servants. She went into their former bedroom with Andrew. Emily's decided to go for the high road. She's gonna be at Andrew's feet. But you beg his forgiveness. Just a boy. Who's the kid? Where from? A terrible hunch pierced Natalia, but she decided not to act yet. She find out everything carefully. The boy seems to be alone. His mom's presence in the house is definitely not. At the first opportunity, Emily literally dragged Svetlana into the room. So tell me, what kind of child? She asked the maid. I do not know. She shrugged her shoulders. Jenna. Name's Ben, and he's five years old. What's mom's name? Maria? And sort of hearing that made Emily's heart squeeze like that. It's Maria again. How could she be here? I mean, everything worked out so well back then. Where is Maria? At the hospital, I think. Which one? And I don't know anything. You'd better ask Andrew. I will, Emily muttered. And after lying in bed, she reasoned even if this Maria, and will have some claims, then Natalia she is definitely not a competitor. But Andrew found out about the son. What's the big deal? You still have to beg his forgiveness. He loved Natalia so much. She's no competition to her. On the other hand, it's good not to have to bring it up. There's already a son. It's the other thing. How to explain? Who was found in the car and where did Emily send the body? She had nothing to do with it. The police got it wrong. And we can blame Maria for that too? She's the one who put the whole thing together so she wouldn't give up the baby. Natalia thought her plan was pretty good. She'll improvise the details as she goes along. The main thing is to charm Andrew. And it was also necessary to establish contact with the boy, so that Andrew could see how much Emily cared for him. In general, Emily began her main epic, and not on the screen, but in life. And she must play it well. At stake is her further trouble-free existence. Except in what clinic no one knew, maybe she'll die. Well, that's just to Emily's advantage. Maria was standing in the vestibule. Now her stop would be the little station in front of Dallas. The train had been standing for one minute. The conductors looked anxiously at the pale as death passenger. Are you all right? Shouldn't we call an ambulance to the station? She asked Maria. No, I'm fine. Rubbing her temples, the girl replied. You'll feel better in the fresh air. I get like this. Do you get seasick? The conductor sighed sympathetically. That's a scourge of my son was so youngest and in the bus and in the train. But it passed with age, and you never. Nodded Maria. Let the conductor better think it was seasickness. And I wanted to sympathize and the look became pitying. Here pity my definitely do not need. The train stopped. And Maria went down with difficulty. The conductor held her down. Maybe an ambulance? She asked again. I should be met. Maria even tried to smile. Don't worry, you're doing so well. Exactly. But good luck to you do not get sick, replied the conductor already from the car, and waved Maria hand. Thank you and all the best to you. Quietly answered the girl and waved back weakly. The train slowly floated away. Maria took a breath of air and turned around. An elderly man with a gray beard in a light shirt and light pants was walking towards her. You, Maria? Deaf, he asked. Yes, Maria answered quietly. She felt better in the fresh air and was able to get a better look at the stranger. Could it be the old man? He had answered her when she looked for a way to him, promised to meet him. Yes, it was he. Are you Christopher? She asked timidly. Christopher confirmed the old man, let's go. We have a long way to go, and he, picking up Maria's light traveling bag, strode forward, 
and the girl hurried after him. She could not walk fast. Her legs felt like absorbent cotton. The old man soon noticed it and spared her the trouble. I see you shook your head weakly and long ago. You've been on the road for a long time and you're not feeling well. I'll make you feel better, Christopher promised. And he seemed to promise good things. But his tone gave Maria goosebumps. She stopped for a second. Where had she come to? Why had she rushed for the life-saving straws? Maybe she should have gone to the hospital after all. Christopher noticed the girl's confusion. What are you doing? He was surprised. Are you afraid of me or what? A little bit, Maria admitted. It is I look so formidable, laughed the old man. Don't be afraid of anything. You'll like it at my place. If I'm going to help you, I'll help you. Tell me, how many from you? Well, it's a bit confusing. They go back. Everybody goes back, the old man chuckled. I feel who my power can help. I send them back immediately, but I'll help you. Thank you, gratefully whispered Maria. They reached the old car. The old man opened the door and nodded, get in. Maria inside did not shrink, realizing that a new attack of bad you and will make you wait. Don't be afraid, it doesn't rock. Understandably, nodded Christopher. Here drink my father. And he handed her a small plastic bottle with brown liquid. Maria twisted the cap. The liquid smelled of honey and something different. Cautiously, she tasted it, smiled deliciously. Drink it. The old man laughed. This is a medicine from Mother Nature. And Maria dared to take a sip and everything swam before her eyes. She couldn't remember anything else. She woke up in a barn on a pile of straw. The moon peeked through the expensive roof. Behind the wall, some night bird screamed. Maria sat up sharply. She felt dizzy and already habitually nauseous. Where is she? What happened? Maria remembered the old man at the station machine bottle created. The old man had interfered with something. Jesus, where did she go? And more importantly, to whom? There's someone at the opposite wall. She's awake. I heard a hoarse female voice. Who is here? Maria whispered in fear. Wendy, what's your name? Maria also came to be treated. The voice grinned. Yes, what a fool. The woman stood up and walked over to Maria, sat down next to her. The girl could see her in the moonlight. She was about 40 years old. Long blonde hair, big eyes, painfully thin. Wendy was wearing a white hoodie. Maria lowered her eyes and realized she was wearing the exact same clothes. I don't understand what's going on. She whispered and got the wrong place. I was told that Christopher cures, cold cures. So again Wendy grinned. With fear and labor therapy. How's that? You'll find out in the morning. Don't scare the kids before they're ready. I thought I was going to die of fear when I got here too. But I'm hanging in there. It's been almost a month now. I found Christopher on the internet too. That's what they said. It's good. A kind grandpa helping selflessly and all that. But in reality, he's a real slave driver. He's a creep, he's the last one. And Wendy told her story. Two years ago, she had some kind of suspicious mole. She had surgery, then chemo, and the disease seemed to recede. But a few months ago, it came back in a more aggressive form. Doctors again suggested chemo but honestly said it wouldn't help for long. And then Wendy found some beautiful Christopher tales on the internet. She believed it, hesitated for a long time, and then decided to die anyway. What if it was a chance? Wendy had no family. No one would talk her out of it. So she rushed to the old man. He met her at the station, gave her some kind of drink, and then she was in the barn. And then Wendy found out how Christopher was treated. He lived with his wife in the middle of nowhere, nearby mountains. The house is a sturdy homestead with a high fence fenced off from curious random travelers. Protection behind that high fence. Christopher used the labor of the unfortunate people who sought his final salvation. He set up in his yard a real mini factory for the production of various souvenirs and things that tourists like to bring from Texas. His wife taught him where she could sit with the needles, but more unfortunate women did all the work. Those who couldn't knit learned quickly, because the tiles were also used. No one tried to run away. Christopher had the clever idea of employing women who were already well off. 
They could still do a lot of work while they were sitting there, by the way. They couldn't run away. For the big criminal ones, he gave them some kind of tincture that made their heads foggy. Are there many of them here? Maria asked with fear after listening to Wendy. It's just you and me now. And there were two others. Jenya disappeared a week ago, and Lena disappeared three days ago. Where did they go? They must have died, Varia replied with a sigh. Christopher sees when a man gets weak and takes him to another barn. To die, probably. Then he gets rid of the body. I don't know how, and I don't want to know. There's a mountain river nearby though, you know which one will carry him away faster. It turns around, throws the bones on the rocks, no one will find them. Or bury them in the taiga. My god, how many people died here? Maria? I don't know. I'll tell you one thing, he's been living here for five years. Camille, his wife, mentioned it once. Christopher Camille is exactly what you make up to be important. That's all. Maria cried, she was so scared. What was she going to do now? What had she done? Yes, she realized that her trip would probably be a one-way trip, but she certainly didn't expect this. Maria remembered Nancy Ben's mom and was so bitter she cried even more bitterly. Not sobbing. Wendy stroked her shoulder. After all, we're the ones who came here. And they don't mock you like that with a whip sometimes. When you work badly from these words, Maria's hair on her head started to stand on end. So she came to the good old man for treatment. No, I don't understand. But why has no one yet found out what this Christopher is doing? Wiping her tears, Maria said. After all, people disappear. Who will prove that they were here? Sighed Varia. There are no witnesses, as you understand. Well, a man went to Dallas. A sick man will die soon enough. Maybe he didn't make it. So he's reported missing, and you're talking about it so calmly. Aren't you scared? Not anymore, and you'll calm down soon. Wendy hugged the mouse. So they, sitting against the wall in the barn, and forgot heavy sleep, fell to the wooden wall of the barn. In the morning, the door creaked open, and the gray-haired old man peeked in. Come out, you've had enough sleep. He shouted in a loud voice. The women obediently reached for the exit. The yard was wide. Purely a meeting. In the middle of the table, a wide awning over it. A little farther away was a good-sized house made of cargo. On the porch stood an immense size, promised Camille. Maria guessed. Babbage approached Maria and looked at her closely. Totally white, unhappily, she said to Christopher. It will not last long. Let her be like that for now. Then we'll find another, he waved away. There is still a lot of work. While the weather allows, we need to impose more. So that in winter, there was something to sell. That's right, too. You don't bring those two faces into the house in winter. Camille nodded. They talked to each other as if neither Wendy nor Maria understood them. And that made Maria even more frightened. Like wordless animals, she. So first, they will order you to come, and then I'll give you coffins to eat, said Camille Marsh to them under the canopy. Wendy obediently went, and Maria stayed where she was. Do you need a special invitation? Shifted his eyebrows menacingly. Camille asked, I won't work for you. Quietly but firmly said Maria. Maria, why are you looking around? Scared, Wendy? Come on, it'll be worse. Did you hear what your friend says? Christopher grinned. And ideas. Or I'll fly you, I will not go. Dropping her head, answered Maria. The next second. She felt the strokes of the whip. Then another and another. My eyes went black. I felt dizzy. Maria fell. Christopher, cursing, dragged her into the barn. Where did you bring such a stiff from? Shouted Camille. It's no use, you see. She won't be anything in the itch. The old man answered her. The mouse fell into a heavy sleep. She did not hear Christopher start his car and drove away. Camille walked around the yard. Everybody was howling at Wendy, and the river and the tall cedars rumbled nearby. At this time at a small station a passerby at Andrew's place. From the few passers, by he asked about a certain old man who cures, but no one had heard of such a man. They just shrugged their shoulders. Somewhere around here he lives apart from everyone else, Andrew explained. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Only people dismissed it. But one woman suggested that Andrew was talking about an old man living with his wife in the mountains. But he doesn't heal. You've been told the wrong thing. 
He and his wife make souvenirs, things for tourists, she explained. He's kind of aloof, doesn't talk to anyone. He's a Baptist, really. Andrew was surprised, but they say they have a house behind a high fence. Doesn't anyone know what's there? They don't let anyone in, but they make good souvenirs and knit very nice mittens and socks. Oh, there he is. The woman waved her hand in the direction of an old car. A tall old man stepped out of the car and headed leisurely towards a building with a loud name of Internet Cafe. Andrew even grinned. The old man went social networking, and then it hit him. And this is how this grandfather can look for his so-called patients. He's a murky old man, so it's obvious that it's useless to talk to him. So Andrew decided to take a little gamble. He waited until the old man came out of the cafe and slightly swaying moved towards him. Excuse me, are you the man who heals? He asked. Then he coughed. The old man looked at him carefully and was silent. I read about you on the internet. How can you help me? What's wrong with you? Finally, the old man said, I'm oncology. My lung doctors won't do anything. They said two months and that's it. Two months? You're saying that in your head? Questioned the old man. Well, let's go. I'll help you as much as I can. At the car he handed Andrew a bottle. Andrew opened the cap and sniffed. Drink this tea. Will it make you feel better? The old man smiled. Andrew took a sip and immediately coughed. Like you were sticky, grumbled the old man. You can't tell. He gently pushed Andrew into the seat and he fell into the cabin. Already lying on the seat, Andrew spat out the liquid he had not swallowed. Then he looked carefully out the window, opened one eye slightly, followed the route. The old man did not even turn around. Why his decoction? It works without fail. They drove for a long time. Finally, some house made of clay. A woman's voice. The old man was explaining something. Then the woman approvingly. Aha, uh -huh, poked, peeked into the parlor. What's he like? That's right. We've got a new well to dig. He should be able to do it. He's huge and you can't tell he's cancer. He's definitely sick. The hell he is. I'm gonna give him my potion just in case. Just not in such a concentration that he can't think anything. Christopher replied. The two of them dragged Andrew into the barn. They laughed on the way, saying, let the house rest with jars. It will be more fun for them. The new girl has taken up her mind, asked Christopher. No, you shouldn't have brought her. It's all right, I'll bring her up tomorrow. She'll start working like a sweetheart. They threw Andrew in the corner, the sheds and left. Andrew lay down for a while and opened his eyes. It was already dark in the barn. The first stars were streaking through the holy roof. Dosti heard a woman's hoarse voice. Maria hesitantly asked Andrew. No, I'm Varia. Maria is asleep. She's had it up to here today, poor thing. Where is she? Andrew jumped up from his seat. Here I am, weak voice. Who are you? Maria, it's me. Andrew White Andrew. The girl gasped. How are you here? Why follow you, Maria? Andrew walked over to the lying girl and sat down next to her in the starlight. They looked at each other confused. How did you find me? Maria whispered. And then she realized, what about Ben? What about him? I left him for you. Don't worry, he and his nanny are very good women. But I don't understand how you got here. Oh, it's a whole story. And Andrew told Maria how he traveled to her village, how he talked to Nancy Miranda, how he looked for her. Maria. I suspected right away that you'd gotten mixed up with some charlatan. So I came looking for you. It's not even a charlatan. A slave owner. Maria answered him quietly, a monster of some kind, and she briefly explained what was going on here. But I'll have them tomorrow, Andrew replied. And some tomatoes lightly hugged Maria by the shoulders. You must be cold. There is a little. Thank you. I'm the one who should thank you for my son. Maria. I didn't know anything at the time. Emily, you were lied to. Really, you didn't know. Maria's voice trembled, and she shook all over. Really? Jesus, I'm freezing, Maria, stop baking for me. We have a son. Maria did not answer him anything, just ducked into his shoulder. Everything that was happening seemed to her like a dream. 
She is now next to someone whom she had never dared to think about before, and he's sitting there with his arms around her, and it seems that all the bad things in her life are gone. In the morning, the door creaks open and Christopher peeks into the barn. You can hear me, he shouted, and immediately received a powerful blow to the jaw. It was Andrew, guarding him against the wall. And you rest now, he said, and then twisted the old man, tied him up with the rope, which just so happened to be on the wall in the barn. Camille came running to the noise. Andrew had a little trouble with her. You shouldn't hit her. Women, after all. But soon the wife was by her husband's side. Andrew walked across the yard, looked around, ignoring the shouts and screams of the bound owners. In the house, he found his briefcase with his papers and his cell phone. Except the phones were no use here. Cell service wasn't picking up. Maria and Wendy's IDs were there too, along with a dozen other passports. All women. Andrew felt goosebumps running up and down his body. Ghouls took advantage of the helplessness of sick people and squeezed the last juices out of them. You should get a life sentence for that. Okay, girls, he commanded Wendy and Maria. Let's go to the nearest police station. We'll turn these bastards in, file a report on them. Let them find out what they've been up to. You're leaving, Varia whispered, and I'm staying. Varia, what are you doing? Surprised Maria, it's not good. I'm very afraid I won't make it. And where would you fit in there? You and Maria are two ahead. In the same place. Andrew answered her. You need to go to the hospital, Wendy. He convinced Wendy. They put the criminals in the back seat. The three of them got in the front and drove off, leaving the horrible yard in the past. True, at first they listened to the screams of cursing pleas of Serafima and Christopher. But Andrew promised to shut their mouths. Then they were silent. At the same station was the office of the district officer. Andrew took Serafima and Christopher there. It took him a long time to believe that what he'd heard was true. But Varia and Maria confirmed the tile marks on Maria's body spoke for themselves. Then Wendy became very bad and the ambulance came to take her away. She said goodbye to Maria, probably not to see her again. Maria thoughtfully looked after the ambulance leaving. Wendy, yes, we don't see each other in this world. But on the other, very soon, she suddenly said aloud, Why are you suddenly going to the other world? Andrew asked jokingly, Andrew, I'm sick. I wrote to you about it. And mom probably told you too, since you were here, right? Yeah, I know all that. But Maria, I didn't tell you yesterday. The main thing is that I found a doctor who's willing to help you. Andrew exclaimed, we have to go to New York right away. To be honest, I don't believe it. I've heard so many things from doctors. I can't be helped. And I say you can be a little angry, exclaimed Andrew. Maria, at least it's a real chance. Or do you want to look for some quack again? No, to Christopher, I definitely will not survive. Maria smiled sadly and nodded. Let's go to New York. At least I can see my son. Emily in the meantime settled in her former home. Not even 24 hours later, when she started shouting at the servants with Galina Dmitrievna, they had a fight. Why did you make this damn boar shit? These cutlets with potatoes. It's all so colorful, harmful. She shouted when she saw what she was going to have for lunch. If you don't like it, don't eat it. The cook replied stoically. Ben really likes baby Ben, who was happily flying already. Worshit smiled contentedly, yes, like a grandma's like a grandma's before Emily clarified. You should live with your grandmother. And left the table without eating. Took and aunt. Quietly whispered the boy behind the hatch viper, winked at him Lucy. And you eat baby. Then don't bang your spoon, reminded Kelly. And everyone went on with their lunch. Everyone pretended that Emily didn't bother them at all. Though she'd gotten on everyone's nerves during the 24 hours she'd been here, especially Svetlana, whom Andrew's ex-wife wanted to make her ally. But Jenna is not a stupid girl, she saw that Emily behaves as if the earth was burning under her feet, runs into this house like a beaten dog and pretends to be the boss. No, honey, your time is up. And Emily, locked in her room, was thinking about what to do next. Yeah, I gotta get in touch with the boy. He's a little wolfish. Although Emily can barely stand him. He should have shown up. 
and when Andrew gets here, he still won't return her calls. Andrew and Maria arrived in the capital in the evening. Maria, after the flight and the events she had experienced, was quite weak. Andrew decided to take her to the clinic immediately. He called Ethan. You found the library, the doctor grinned. Sure, bring her in. The sooner we start working on her, the better the chances of a favorable outcome. Maria passed out in the cab and into the clinic. Andrew carried her in his arms, safer. He begged Ethan. She's so young. She has two children, she has to live. I'll do everything in my power. Dryly, the doctor nodded. And you go home. You yourself have no face, but payment tomorrow, all questions tomorrow. And the doctor literally forced Andrew out of the clinic. Maria was taken to the examination room. She was now being treated by top-notch specialists. She was in God's hands. Ethan, he's pulled so many people out of the dead, and he's gonna save her. Eh, Maria, Maria. If then, coming to the office, C had stayed and waited for me to explain everything, then there would not be what there is now. Reasoned Andrew to himself, sitting in the cab. It's a terrible trip, meeting a crazy old man, and it's taken even more of your strength. But you hang in there, girl, hang in there, your kids need you and I need you. Andrew froze from his thoughts. Yes, in the short time he had been with Maria. Andrew realized how much he cared for her. He could still feel her fragile shoulders under his palms, felt her soft silken hair touching his cheek, and his heart sank to that night in the barn when Maria slept on his shoulder. Had been some kind of revelation, she was so defenseless, and only he could shelter her from all adversity. But only if they weren't too late. If only Ethan would help her. A guard met him in the courtyard of the mansion. When he saw his master, he was a little embarrassed. Andrew, here's the thing. He laughed a little. What else? Tired? Andrew asked. I let Natalia in the house. She came in looking like you made up. You didn't say anything about letting her in or not. Where is she now? Andrew frowned. Just at the house. Sveta told me that she behaves there as if you were not divorced. That is, she's managing. Well, it's interesting. On the catcher and the beast, as they say. Andrew hummed. Okay, Grishin, you relax. It's okay. And he went, leaving the guard to puzzle over who is the beast and who is the catcher. Let the rich guys figure it out for themselves. Andrew stopped by Ben's first thing. He and his nanny were looking at children's magazines. Hello, joyfully exclaimed the boy and ran up to Andrew. Are you back? Did you find mommy? We are going to her from grandma's window. The little boy rushed with questions. Andrew laughed oh, I don't know what to answer you. It's like this. Tomorrow you and I will go to visit mommy in the hospital. And then I'll take you to see grandma Tanya and Nancy. I miss them, the boy confided. I miss mommy the most, but you're my good boy. Don't worry, I'll see you tomorrow. Come here, I'll give you a hug. Andrew took the boy in his arms, then lifted him a little. Listen, why are you like this? Like I'm a stranger to the girl? I'm your family, I'm your daddy. The boy trustingly hugged him by the neck, and the touch of those small hands made Andrew's heart beat faster. Yes, he is. Andrew, I don't understand. Kelly interrupted their idol. So you don't need my services anymore? I understand the boy is leaving here tomorrow. He'll be gone for a while, but he'll be back. Andrew smiled at the old woman. And I hope that you and I will continue to have a business relationship. Well, that's fine with me. Ben, wonderful little man. They talked some more. Andrew put her son to bed. As Kelly was leaving the boy's bedroom, Emily glimpsed in the hallway. She already knew Andrew had arrived and was really looking forward to seeing him. Emily thought that Andrew would be surprised. He might get angry in the beginning, but she would manage to extinguish his anger. There used to be such love between them. It couldn't have disappeared without a trace. Andrew walked out of the bedroom. Emily stood by the stairs all confused, like a beaten dog. Hello, Andrew, she said in a trembling voice. I called you many times. Then I came here. I need to talk to you. I saw your inbox, but I didn't have time for you. So you came to my house right away, Andrew grinned. You have your own apartment, don't you? What do you want? Andrew, you're mad at me.
and you're 1,000 times right. I've made so many mistakes, and I just realized that I can't be without you. Andrew, I'm sorry for everything. I love you. You do. Andrew shook his head with a grin. Andrew, I know you've been looking for me. So you think you haven't forgotten about me, and I can't. Stop it. Andrew bellowed, and immediately lowered his tone so as not to wake Ben. Enough with the comedy. You know very well that it's over between us, and it's been over for a long time. But you know, it's a good thing you came here. Now you'll explain everything to me. He grabbed Natalia by the arm and dragged her into the study. And there Emily continued to play the unhappy Andrew in love. And I felt so bad without you, without our home. Sweet Igor me. After all, we were together for so many years, and for so many years I wore huge horns. That's not true. It's all her say. Many envious of our happiness. And you believed it. Andrew, I love only you. Andrew sat in a chair and looked at his ex-wife. She's Leela. Tears clutched at my heart. I just realized what an ancient actress you are, didn't I? He said. And how did I not notice it before? Okay, I'm satisfied. Now I'm waiting for you to explain. How did it happen that Maria was alive? You were the one who delivered her body. Maria frowned. Emily, ah, the one. That's what I did. Then she paid the people from the ritual. They took her back to her home village. Is it my fault I made a mistake in identifying her? You remember what was left of the body, don't you? Yeah, it's a strange story. It turns out she's alive. And this boy is in your house. So that's our son, Andrew. So she's a criminal and she should be tried. Not only did she break contracts five years ago, run off with our kid, but she framed some other poor girl. Maybe she nailed her and set the car on fire. And now she shows up at your house and she wants something from you. Andrew, we need to call the police right now. She's a criminal. I'll call the police first. I wanted to hear the truth, not the fairy tale you're trying to tell me. Andrew walked over to his ex-wife and grabbed her arm. Or are you telling me everything? And then I let you go. Or I call the police, file a report, and let them handle it. I'll be in charge of the investigation from now on. And I assure you, you'll go to jail for a long time. But it's not my fault. Emily said pitifully. It's not. To begin with, you bribed the doctors to plant the embryo. Emily's face changed. She hissed and said calmly in the back of her head. Of course you did. What else could I do? Doctors rejected all my eggs. And here's this fool who agrees to anything to save her back. And everything was going so well until you started looking into it. I saw the way you looked at her. I had to get rid of her. And I told her the truth. I knew she couldn't give up her baby. And that was the right calculation. That's where the woman's corpse in the car came from. Emily sighed heavily, thinking, pacing the room, thinking about something. Then she stopped and looked at Andrew with hatred. How much do I hate you? She said quietly. You're finally telling the truth. I love you, I love you. Andrew said sarcastically. You've been saying all your life child is a child. Not paying attention to his tone, continued Emily. She had already spoken and spoken. And there was no stopping her anger. The baby was spilling out of her. What do I need that snotty puppy for? Especially from another woman. Then I put her on the train. I was able to steal her passport after checking her documents. That fool went away happy. What about her belly button now? I should have acted. You ruined a man. Andrew looked at his ex-wife in horror. Are you out of your mind? Emily laughed nervously. Why would I do that when I have billets? The day before conducting Maria, I found a suitable corpse in one of the morgues. You out, you got hit by a car. The corpse was unclaimed. For a small fee, I managed to do it all. And the cab driver got so much money, he took off to the south somewhere. Then I built the accident. You couldn't have done it on your own. Did you have accomplices? Emily lowered her eyes to admit to her ex-husband that at that time she had an affair with a general from the organs was beyond her strength. The general helped her well, gave her people who arranged everything. He put the case on the brakes. He explained to the investigator what and how to do that unknown woman. I tried to get her buried in the nearest cemetery, 
That was no problem at all. He was a good man. But he died a year after the whole thing. He had a stroke. It's a shame. Emily cried a little bit then, but then she forgot. So who helped you? Andrew raised his voice. He's no longer alive, Emily admitted. Andrew only shook his head. Here, in fact, he knows everything. He didn't need the details. He'd already guessed something like that, though. Now he knows for sure. There's one thing I don't understand, he said at last. Why did you come to my house now? Aren't you ashamed to look me in the eye? My son. Andrew, I'm willing to kneel for as long as you say. I'm sorry. I've done everything for our love, for my money. You did everything, Andrew answered her sharply. And at the same time, you did not forget to sleep with other men. So, so get out of my house, and I don't want to see you again, within a radius of five kilometers. Got it. Andrew, how can you do this? Another tear. Emily, don't get emotional. Think about it. I mean, we used to be good together. Until I found out about your cheating. And do you really think I can forgive you for the Maria thing? You took away five years of my son's life. Get out. If you don't leave now, I'll call the police, and I'll definitely file a report on you. I don't have any money. Emily whispered. None at all. What can I do to help? Andrew grinned. And thank God you're out. Go away nicely. I forgive you. But I don't think I will if you come after me or my son or Maria. Maria, so there's something between you two. I'm not mistaken. Emily exclaimed. Evil glared at her. And that's none of your business. And I'm warning you again. Don't mess with us anymore. And so Emily left Andrew's mansion that night. Soon Emily sold the apartment and moved away. Where to? Why? No one ever saw her again. Andrew didn't bother to dredge up the past. It was too tedious. I mean, I had to shake down the doctors and deal with the police. Let the past be the past. The next day, Andrew and Ben went to see Maria. She was in a separate room. She'd regained consciousness. She was being prepped for surgery. Despite her weakness, Maria tried to lift herself up on the bed when she saw her son. My son, she said quietly, barely holding back her tears. Mommy, Ben exclaimed. He ran joyfully to the bed and immediately moved his eyebrows like an adult. So, Mommy, you lie down. You need to save your strength. Daddy said you'll need it. Daddy smiled through her tears and hugged her boy. Then she looked furtively at Andrew. He was standing next to her and trying to smile. He believed that everything would work out. Thank you, Maria whispered. I realized that everything in this clinic is very expensive. Don't even think about it. Thank you. Andrew replied and sat down next to her on a chair. Don't worry about anything. I will go to your mom and daughter today, call them to check on them. Daddy, you said you were taking me to see them. Don't you get it, boy? Of course I am, but it's just for a while. And then I'll take you all back to my place. I just need to get my mom fixed up. Andrew, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Maria touched his hand. Her fingers trembled. The only thing I want to ask is that if anything, you take care of Ben and Nancy, please. I know I don't have the right to ask, but my little girl, if anything happens to mommy, has no one in the world. I told you we are all together now. Andrew answered her seriously. And don't think bad thoughts. The doctor said that everything will be fine. Maria only nodded weakly in response. In fact, Ethan did not give any favorable prognosis. He refused to talk about it at all. Everything would be clear during the operation. That day, Andrew only stopped by the office, then together with Ben went to the distant Danilova. Andrew decided that for the duration of the operation let the boy be with his own grandmother, and then we'll see what to do. For almost the entire trip Ben sat behind Andrew and gazed rapturously out the window. For the boy, it was the first such long trip in the car. And toward evening, when they stopped at a roadside motel, Andrew lay down on the bed and fell asleep. Andrew lay down beside him, carefully covered the boy with the blanket. Sleep, son, he whispered. And in the morning they set off again. They were in the village by lunchtime. Andrew almost passed Miranda's house. Didn't recognize him. Ben certainly didn't recognize it. Only recognized the apple trees in the orchard. Where's our house? With fear, asked the boy. 
and this is it, and it is only repaired. Laughed Andrew. With pleasure looking at the work of the construction team. Well done guys and the roof was repaired, and plastic windows inserted and the general house, and the foundation was adjusted. There was not the same old barn that writhed menacingly in the back of the homestead. In its place stood a small farm building. All to the point and to the point now. They got out of the car, out of the house, ran out Nancy, followed by her, leaning on a cane, came out and grandmother Miranda you, and grandson my favorite, shrieked old Ben. The boy blossomed into a smile and rushed to his grandmother, to his little sister. They hugged each other, talking excitedly. Andrew stood nearby and smiled. How good it is when relatives are together. He couldn't keep Ben away from Nancy and Miranda, even if something happened to Maria. And then he mentally warned himself with Maria, and everything would be fine. Later they were in the kitchen drinking and talking tea. Miranda thanked and thanked Andrew. Now she has a house like a toy. All the neighbors are envious. The builders wanted to rebuild the stove, but I wouldn't let them. It's already getting cold while they're assembling and disassembling. We will with a wall in the cold and soot to live in the dirt, once again we'll bring. And I still have a good stove. An old lady told me it'll last five years for sure. Let it stay that way for now. Next year you'll need gas. I see the pipe over there in your garden. Yes, it's a pipe. It's just a road. Don't worry about that. They were silent. And when the brother and sister ran into the room, the elderly woman with anxiety and trembling in her voice asked her main question. How was her daughter? The others wanted to rebuild the stove, but I wouldn't let them. It's already getting cold while they're assembling and disassembling. We will with a wall in the cold and soot to live in the dirt, once again we'll bring. And I still have a good stove. An old lady told me it'll last five years for sure. Let it stay that way for now. Next year, you'll need gas. I see the pipe over there in your garden. Yes, it's a pipe. It's just a road. Don't worry about that. They were silent. And when the brother and sister ran into the room, the elderly woman with anxiety and trembling in her voice asked her main question. How is her daughter? Andrew did not tell the details of the trip to Dallas, only mentioned that he had found her quickly and the brains in the rules said that she should be treated by the right doctors. That's right, said Miranda's grandmother, wiping away her tears. That's what doctors do. Yes, the operation will be one of these days. For now, tests, preparation, Miranda. Ben, she'll stay with you for a while. Because I have a job with a nanny, of course, it is good for him. It's better with you. You're still asking, the old lady shook her hands. Ben is my family, I'm always better with him. But he wasn't. And my heart was not in place. And now I'm ready to sing songs. I have my daughter's blood with me. I wish Maria would get better. Let's hope so, nodded Andrew. He left, promising to come back soon. Miranda, after seeing him off and putting the grandchildren to bed, stood by the icon of Nicola the Wonder Worker for a long time and prayed silently. The word was indecipherable. What are they for, when the prayer comes from the heart? The elderly woman thanked that her stubborn daughter was found, that she agreed to the treatment and asked for one thing to give strength to her car. A little more about the miracle. May this sore not turn out to be so terrible. The surgery was scheduled for Friday. Ethan had personally called Andrew and informed him about it. Now all we had to do was wait, but the phone was silent. Things were getting out of hand. Andrew sat and waited. Kate, seeing the chief's tension, tried to distract him somehow. She made tea or coffee. Kate, your coffee will soon come out of my ears. Suddenly, Andrew said in a pitiful voice, Oh, I'm sorry, Arabella Kate. I can just see that you're having a hard time. Yeah, you're right. And why is this surgery taking so long? It's gonna be okay, you'll see. Kate smiled encouragingly. Of course, no one knew for sure, but everyone was hopeful. By the way, the office found out Andrew and Maria's whole story from somewhere. Who? No one thought much of it. It's just that Kate kept in good touch with Larissa Petrovna, the nanny. But she told the story, which she witnessed by accident. Did not know the details, but enough of the main thing. Andrew's ex-wife brought her husband, 
sold a surrogate mother, who turned out to be no surrogate at all. That's how twisted the story turned out to be. The subordinates in the office were really worried about Maria, because it was she and her boy who brought them back a normal boss. Andrew had turned into a robot. Lately, finally the clinic called. Ethan tiredly said that everything went well, the tumor was taken for histology. The first analysis shows its good quality, but we still need to scrutinize it. It's so big. And it would have killed the patient anyway if it hadn't been for this surgery. So what's the fear now? Asked Andrew. Now get ready, young man. I think you have a big change ahead of you, Ethan said with a smile. Andrew thanked him and hung up the phone. Had they really succeeded? Then the phone rang again. It was the genetic testing clinic. We sent you the results of the research to the post office, said a pleasant female voice. You can familiarize yourself. Girl, you can say in your own words, asked Andrew. In principle, he was long ago did not care what the examination would show. And if in your own words, you are the biological father of the boy. The second analysis. The girl and the boy are related to each other. Thank you, thanked Andrew. And then smiled and shrugged. He already knew all that. Christmas was only a couple days away. Finally, Maria was able to leave the clinic. She was still weak, pale, but most importantly healthy. Yes, she had been through a lot. And now only a growing hedgehog on her head. She still had the occasional dizzy spell and nausea. The doctor explained that it's normal. It would all pass. Then Nancy came to meet her. Andrew with a huge bouquet of flowers. They laughed, they hugged Maria. And they were all family now. Not long ago Andrew had moved the children and Miranda into the city. Nancy now went to a prestigious high school. Ben is in daycare. Miranda is having her joints treated by big-name doctors. They're all living together in Andrew's mansion, waiting for Maria to be discharged. Mommy, we put up such a beautiful Christmas tree. Ben was giddy with excitement. It's so huge. Out in the yard, Nancy added. We thought it was better this way. Dad suggested it. It's great. A Christmas tree, alive and everyone's in a festive mood. Dad also bought us a Labrador puppy. I kept bragging about Ben. What a great daddy we have. Maria smiled. The best. And she stepped toward Andrew and looked him in the eye. Did I ever dream that one day I would meet someone as wonderful as you? Andrew, you're a real wizard. Thank you. I'm still learning, Andrew smiled. Oh, by the way, you still owe me something. That you're confused. You haven't answered me yet. Will you marry me? Maria laid her head on his shoulder and quietly said, You're my favorite. And only with you I want to be until the end. Of course, I agree.